So my name's Shane Milky. Um, I'm kind of maybe going to be extending a little bit upon what the previous speaker was talking about, um, but kind of in a different way. Uh, my topic is work-life balance, using your extracurricular life to achieve professional goals. Um, to be honest, I figured this might be kind of like a boring topic or something that might not initially sound all that interesting to people, so I kind of um, whimsically came up with some other titles that, you know, please know that I'm just joking when I say some of these things, but um, how many people out there maybe are looking to um, be well-known as designers, win awards, anything like that? Anybody? One, two, three, four, cool. Okay, so we got some designers out there. So like high speed, low drag, how to win awards, working less than 40 hours a week. Anybody maybe think about a topic like that might be interesting. Uh, who here wants to make more money? A lot of people I hope would, you know, so you know, once again, kind of being whimsical. Earn more, work less, kicking ass without killing yourself. Um, once again, that's just kind of me being funny. So coming back to it, you know, the topic for me was um, work-life balance and how kind of over time I was out of balance and kind of come into balance, back into balance. So once again, my name is Shane. Um, you know, we all kind of have our, our calling cards and, uh, you know, what we're known for and things. I'm a designer, developer, front-end developer, animator, photographer. Um, I've done a bunch of stuff. I've been doing this stuff since I was, uh, since 1996, so when it was first kind of, uh, Internet was first coming out and all that type of fun stuff. Uh, I'm kind of the cliche jack of all trades. I do, um, you know, I've kind of seen there, seen it, done it all. I used to work at a company uh, called Too Advanced. Anybody remember Too Advanced from back in the day? Hands, so I can kind of, all right, so I worked at Too Advanced. I was their creative director for 10 years. And, um, you know, at the time they were one of the big, uh, you know, Flash studios. I mean, it was when Flash was kind of the cool thing to do, and, you know, that's what we were doing. So over the years I've done, Done kind of a lot, I guess I would say. Um, this is just a quick overview of some of the things because I'm not going to be getting too visual here later on. It's not. This isn't really about my work. This is more about how other things outside of work have influenced my work and um, how efficient I am. So you know, just kind of going down. These are some of my featured you know things that I've worked on over the years, and this is kind of going chronologically. So this is like recent to to uh, you know to long ago. Going down here's something I worked on the uh, the. Uh, in-game UI of the Epic Mickey 2 video game. So if you go and buy that game, pop it into your Wii or your, your PlayStation or whatever and play it. I did all the little you know, graphics and animations and, and crazy things. Um, you know, once again, with the jack of all trades mentality, some of these are websites. Some of these are apps. The Bear is an app. Um, War in the North is another video game that I worked with. Uh, you guys all saw Bradley talk yesterday. Bradley and I collaborated and we did uh, his website together, one of his websites. Um, so once again, this is just my calling card, and this is the only reason why I'm kind of showing this now is to kind of validate that, you know, hey, I'm a working individual. I've kind of been there. I've done that. I've been doing things because I think that the tone of, you know, some of the things that I'm going to talk about later could kind of be misconstrued about, you know, maybe I'm, you know, telling you guys not to work or not to work hard or not to, not to do good work. Uh, hopefully that doesn't, uh, doesn't come out because that's definitely not, not my intention or not what I, what I want to say. So going back to the the talk, work-life balance. So I have a confession, you know, I used to suck and this was way back in the day uh, when we all first started. I think we all, you know, aren't good at something. Um, and when I first talked to Drew, when he talked about what the purpose of ValueCon was, um, he said it should be to inspire people to build things on their own. And he said this could mean a building of a company, app, product. Well, for me, I realized that, you know, when I went on, it's what I wanted to talk about was um, I'm a product, we're all products. You know, as an individual designer, whether it's our name um, out there as a freelancer, whether it's our name and we're kind of hidden, hidden in a company that we work for and nobody knows about it, nobody knows about us, you know, but we are, ourselves are, or can be products. You know, a lot of, some people, I mean, the, one of the previous speakers talked about, you know, he likes to facilitate what other people do and things like that. Um, you know, this is kind of a little bit different. So for me, the product was me and I think that it all applies to all of you depending upon where you are professionally. Um, but um, one thing I realized is that, you know, like I said before, that over the course of my career, I've been out of balance in things. So, you know, when I say I have a confession, I sucked and I used to work for too much, that was, you know, for obvious reasons. You know, we have, uh, you've got to get better. You have to improve at, improve at what, you, what you do and what you are. Um, and so I'm talking about, you know, how that's kind of changed over the, over the course of my career. Now, 
when I talk about work-life balance and I talk about not working too much, some of you guys might be going like, oh, like, of course, like, who wants to work too much? And for you people that have that all kind of already figured out, it's really cool. I applaud you. The problem that I had was, you know, I love what I do so much that I would just, I just was all in. You know, I was so soaked into what I was doing that, uh, you know, I was doing what I had to do to, to not suck. You know, so what that meant is, you know, working long hours, you know, doing things I'm sure we've all had to do, um, you know, cranking along and doing all sorts of crazy things, you know, to, to make sure that I'm, I'm becoming better. Um, but if there's one thing that I've talked, you know, as I've talked to friends and um, coworkers and things over the, over the past five, 10 years, there's kind of a big gap, um, as far as at least the people that I circle with, you know, as, as to how to balance all that stuff, because we're all so passionate, we're all coming to conferences like these to find out how to be better, and you know, how to you know, be inspired and go off and you know, make our own millions, make our own products, make our own you know, selves and whatever those are. And usually, you know, we all know the answer to that. You gotta put time into it. You have to you know, put the effort in. It doesn't just, you know, unless it's an accident sometimes, it's, it's, um, you know, it's not just gonna happen, happen by a, a miracle. You know, that stuff happens rare. Um, so once again, for me, just you know that um, this was a problem for me because I love so much what I do. So when I say I suck, going back a little bit, you know, I, I truly mean you know that like in the early days, like we all did, you know. But for me, like I said, it was 1996, and so I'm talking about like the, you know, the early 14.4 modem, you know, days. The, you know, this is like a 640 by 480 screenshot of a website that I did, like my first, one of my first. Websites, bevels, you know, it's bevels, there's some drop shadows in there and things like that. And this was before, like, even Photoshop had, like, uh, automatic effects. You know, you had to, like, go in and do this stuff, you know, with, like, uh, um, with layers and, and lighting effects and different things to, you know, achieve, you know, some of those different things. You know, but of course, the, you know, the internet's new and, you know, you're having fun and, you know, this is the, this is how, this is where we were back then. So to now to progress to kind of where I'm at now and, um, you know, show like, you know, that through a lot of hard work, you know, you come a long way and, you know, actually be doing stuff. This is a project that I'm currently working on right now that's a, a WebGL experience for the Batmobile for the new Batman Arkham Knight video game that's coming out. So one thing I do want to say, though, is no matter what I, I say here today that, um, you know, when you're young, you have to put in that time, you have to put in that work, nothing does happen automatic, you're the lowest person on the totem pole, you can't just, uh, you know, Things just uh, don't happen automatically. So, next thing is, is when I say that you know, so reading this, loving your job is good and bad. Well, you know, it's good. I mean, I think a lot of people, like my wife, for example, struggles with finding something that you're really passionate about. You know, so it's really good if you guys all kind of love what you do and you're, you know, doing, you know, charging down that path of what you're passionate about. But the, you know, this can also be a really bad thing because, like I said, you can dedicate too much time into something. And um, you know, sometimes dedicating too much time doesn't mean you know, that there's crazy deadlines. It doesn't mean it's the boss who's asking you to stay later because he promised something to the client. You know, sometimes that staying late or doing extra things is just because you're just having so much fun. Um, and that's a good thing, but you know, it can also lead to, lead to some, some, um, some possible negative things. And I'm gonna go over here in a little bit. Um, so question I have, you guys have been moderately cooperative. Uh, who's, who here is in their 20s? Okay, so we got 20s. Who here's in the 30s? 30s. Who here's in their 40s plus? <laughs> so I, I'm, you know, I thought I saw someone had some gray hair earlier. So I, you know, evidently I'm the only 40-year-old in the room. So you know, this I think is, you know, to me that's this is a good thing because I feel like some of the things that I have to have to talk about are going to be valuable because I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stages that I've gone through, how I had to adapt to them. So for some of you, hopefully, it's you know, it's some things that you know you don't. Uh, don't uh, you listen to and maybe soak in a little bit and hopefully maybe, you know, five years or 10 years from now, you kind of go, oh, I kind of remember this a little bit. You know, I've heard this somewhere. Um, so, now the question being a little interactive, what are, what are some other people's goals? I know mine um, and I'll talk about them a little bit more. I wanted to um, follow in the footsteps of some of the people who were influencing me at the time. Um, like Eric Jordan, Bradley, G Monk, who was, you know, I wanted to be known, I wanted to win awards, I wanted to be published, I wanted, you know, all of those kind of superficial things that at the time when Flash was kind of coming out, like those, that's what everyone was doing, that's what you migrated to. So what are, is anybody feeling brave enough to say what some of their personal goals are right now? Please? Come on. All right, well, we'll move on from that then. Uh, I'll pass by the what are your hobbies too, because and this might be a bad thing that you guys didn't, uh, 
didn't say you know that uh, you know what some of these things are because you know it might mean that you're a little bit out of sync. So this is a question I think everyone should feel. How many hours a week do people work? Um, who here averages 30 hours a week? Give me that like that's like where you where you set your limit. 30 hours a week. Who here, who here is 40? Okay, now we're getting. Who here is 50? More than 50? Okay. So what is the Longest you've worked without sleep. Who here, I mean, this might be an obvious one. Who here has done 24 hours? Okay. Who here has done 48 hours? Who here has done more than 48 hours? What's your, what's your number? What, how long, what's your number? Uh, 64. 64. You have me beat. So mine is 56 straight hours. And I don't say that. I mean, there, there's a part of me that when I was younger and even now, I go, oh, that's kind of cool. Like, you know, put 56 straight hours into something. Like, that's, you know, it's kind of admirable. But... I look back now and I go, gosh, that's really crazy. Like, what, you know, what the heck was I thinking? What the, what the heck was I doing? You know, um, so I've kind of come to terms with some things in my life as I've gotten older. And like I said, I'm the, I'm the lone 40-year-old in the, in the room. You know, the, you know, throwing more time at something isn't, or, you know, having a deadline that's unreachable, you know, might not be actually a good thing. So for me, the, you know, what's the secret? You know, I talked earlier about, like, work-life balance. So what's the secret to... Um, achieving your professional goals, but without working all of the time. Hopefully, hopefully, some of you people that raise your hands with the 40s, 50s, and 60 hours, you have an ultimate goal that you don't have to do that much time later on in life. Um, but so, what's the secret that I've found to to this? Might be kind of a weird one. It's have something more important to do outside of work. Anyone kind of figure out what that means? Basically, what it means is have something that you're committed to outside of work that's completely different than work. I'm not talking about going back and you know, playing around uh, you know, on your site. I'm not talking about you know, doing something that's um, a collab or anything like that. I'm talking about having something that you're purely committed to that you basically can't keep working past. You, know, you have to kind of get, get away and you have to set a limit on what you're working for so that you, know, you, you have to end your work day or your work at least at some point you know, during the day something that you've planned ahead of time. Um, I've kind of used this strategy in a lot of phases of my life. The, the things that I've used as, the, you know, as that more important thing to do has changed, but you know, that strategy has always kind of been there, and it's really helped me work uh, more efficiently. So for me, these have been my four, four life stages so far. So I've got the self-centered single 20s, uh, the teamwork married early 30s, the chaos kids in late 30s, and the four all grown up. So some of you are on the one, some of you are in the teamwork phase, some of you, I've, I heard some people talk about being married and things. Um, some of you are maybe in the chaos phase. Uh, I'm still kind of in the chaos phase, but also in, in phase four. Some of you are gonna completely miss all of these, or not all of these, but some of these, some of you won't hit teamwork, some of you won't hit chaos. That's all good to you know, try and, and take the message of what I'm talking about. Um, <coughs> And just apply it to yourself, though. Um, like I said, these are my four life stages, and it just kind of made it easier for me to kind of break, break through those thing, these things because, uh, you know, it's stuff that I think, you know, a lot of people are going to go through. And, and one thing I would say, too, is, you know, I'm talking about very personal things and kind of like outside of work. Like, you know, I think you go to a lot of conferences, or I've been to conferences, and they talk about these things and these life stages, but they're all in the context of work. You know, it's like, oh, my climb from a junior designer to an art director to a creative director to you know, a, you know, whatever, you know, owner to a business owner. You know, I think there's a lot of things out there that, you know, and people talking out there about, you know, those climbs, and I think those are all kind of really tangible, but it's, you know, sometimes some of these other things that, you know, they're, they're not something you can kind of Google and talk about and, and uh, discuss unless you've got friends that are in those, uh, in those kind of things. So stage one, self-centered. So regardless of what I say about, you know, or I've already said about, hey, you know, maybe watch how much you're working and stuff, you know, this is, this is the fun time, right? This is the time where you guys have, you know, all the crazy time in the world to do anything you want. You know, you can stay up all night. You can agree to take on the project that nobody wants to take on. You can, you know, do whatever you want for the, you know, to sell yourself out for the company you're working for. Um, it, it's really kind of a fun stage, to be honest, you know, because you just kind of feel invincible. You feel like Superman. You can kind of do anything, and there's no limits. There's no, you know, there's no one to answer to. You know, there's nothing other than yourself, you know, that uh, if you make a promise to, you know, hey, I'm going to commit to this project, or I'm going to commit to this deadline, you know, there's, there's nothing to, you know, it's, it's you. It's not, not um, you know, you don't get in trouble, you know, for, for staying up too late or, or working too long. 
There's no accountability other than yourself. So for me, the thing that I had that was my biggest distraction earlier on in, uh, in my career was I was a coach. I coached football, high school football. And it might sound kind of a random thing to talk about at a conference. But um, so something that for me, like when I graduated from college, I, um, I started coaching. I didn't know what my career was for like a year or two. I kind of fumbled around and wasn't really sure what, what the heck I wanted to do, what I was doing. Um, so I fell back into what I did. I played football in college and high school, and, and I just kind of started coaching. And uh, so here's a picture back in the day um, in the bottom left, second, second coach in. Um, does anyone here follow NFL football? Anybody? Hand raise, maybe. Uh, anyone know who Carson Palmer is? He's uh, number three up at the top, goofy looking grin on his face. He plays in the NFL. Um, he plays for the Arizona Cardinals right now. So for me, this was kind of like my first real world uh, experience. And this is an example that I have for you guys of something I had in my life that I had commitment to. Um, and I kind of kept it all through, for 16 years I coached, and those 16 years kind of count four years of college, but, so for 11 professional years, this is something, my extracurricular activity that I had, that, uh, you know, I couldn't get away from, for good reason, I loved it, you know, this was, this was something I used as motivation, but, you know, it was something that, you know, if I, uh, you know, if I made a deadline, if I made a plan, I had to work around this type of thing, it wasn't something that, um, you know, I could get out of. So, you know, this kind of brings my next topic, which is, you know, use your hobbies as motivation. So the thing about, you know, me, my situation coaching football is you can't, uh, you couldn't uncommit, you know what I mean? Like if you're in the middle of a season, like you have to be there for practice, you have to be there for games, you have to be there for everything, you know? So for, you know, you can't just, uh, you know, decide not to show up to work that day or to coach that day, you have to, you have to be there. So once again, this is an example of a coaching example of, you know, one thing I've found to, you know, occupy myself outside of work. So the, the problem with me doing this was, though, that um, I started to find that as I made commitments to, you know, other, to my work-based things, that uh, I found ways around the fact that I had this distraction, which was supposed to be kind of like my, you know, freeing me up and kind of getting me out of work. Um, so it brings, uh, do something for three days in a row and it will become a habit. So this is something that my mom always used to joke around about my dad and say like, oh, if your dad did something three days in a row, he'd just do it forever. Like, he would just keep doing it. So it could be clothes, it could be what he ate, you know, whatever. So basically what happened to me was, is you can all kind of, you know, imagine, uh, you know, one day you have a deadline, so you start, you know, coming in and you um, put your work after your activities. It's so like that you come back and you hop on at 10 o'clock or whatever, and you say, I'll work till, I'll work till, till one or two, I'll, you know, kind of get this, you know, get this back in order because I didn't have enough time, time through the day. So here's an example of what my schedule back then used to be. Um, 6 a.m., wake up. 7 a.m., get into work. Uh, work straight till 3 p.m., no lunch. Uh, get out, go to football practice. Uh, 6 to 7, work out for myself. 7 to 9, relax. And 9 to 1, work shift round 2, 1 to 6, sleep. You know, not a whole lot of, not a whole lot of priority on, on sleep or you know, other people or anything like that. And once again, this is my example. This is football. It might sound kind of random to be talking about football and high school football. But, uh, you know, once again, this is my example. So, you know, obviously, I have to be honest, there were flaws with that. You know, you can't throw more time, you know, necessarily at things all the time. And you can't have, you know, bloated interests outside that, you know, are kind of affecting, you know, how you're making your living. Um, so the flaws, you know, were there's only 24 hours in a day. Uh, sleep is somewhat important. And having too many things to do is unsustainable because it doesn't take others into account. And that's, that's kind of a big thing that, um, to talk about because as we get into, you know, for me, stage two, for you guys, it's, uh, you know, finding a special person in your life. Could be marriage, ending up in marriage, whatever. It could just be the, you know, the random special person that's, you know, there right now. Like, if you guys are working crazy hours and you're doing, you know, you're so jamming on your careers, there's no time for, you know, other people necessarily. And you have to, I want you guys to all kind of think about that as, you know, you kind of go in and out of maybe this stage two of your life. So for me, um, you know, it's like I said, when, when you hit stage two, everything kind of changes whether you realize it or not. There's now accountability to someone else. You know, you can't just uh, work straight through to things without at least having to uh, answer to somebody. For me, it was kind of a slow, gradual change, but uh, when it hit, it hit. Um, so for me, I ended up getting married. Finding the love of my life. First few years, the uh, nothing really changed too much. We both were kind of still jamming on our careers. We were both in that selfish stage, even though we were kind of being teammates. She was going to nursing school, 
studying her butt off, and I was working, you know, those crazy long hours and you know schedule that we talked about. Uh, so it didn't really uh, didn't really affect anything. But then, you know, what, what happens when you're in relationships? You know, like hopefully the hope is that you're both in the same kind of uh, kind of realm. But a lot of times, what happens is one person will fall out, one person will stay in. You know, you kind of suddenly hit like these different phases in your life, and you have to kind of adapt with that. So for me, that was when my wife finished nursing school and um, suddenly had a lot more time in her hands. Sure, she was working during the days, but those like, you know, seven, eight, nine, you know, all that stuff was now suddenly like, hey, you know, come on, come and hang out. What are you doing? Like, oh, you have to, you know, you have your extracurricular activities, or hey, you're, you're working. And like I said, uh, you know, I'd, I'd become into the habit that, the, you know, that nine to 10 was like my catch up phase, my I'm still getting better phase, I'm, you know, cranking along at, you know, whatever project phase. And, uh, you know, it definitely, kind of came to, came to butting heads at some point. So this brings uh, into my next thing. It was a, it was a, for me, I look back and I kind of laugh at it now, but you know, I remember distinctly it was this, like a Saturday, probably like a 10 or 11 o'clock in the day, and I had already kind of started my catch-up phase. I was working on a project, and uh, you know, in my head, I'm like, oh, you know, I, I got to keep cranking on this. This, this one's going to win an award. Like, this one's like a really important project. And my wife walks in and says, like, hey, wh what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm just, you know, putting some, some finishing touches on this. this. is really important. You know, it's, it's like due next week, but I, I have to get ahead on this thing. And, uh, you know, her answer was basically what you see in front of you. It's like, well, you know, you said this is going to win an award. Haven't you won that one before? Like, why is this important? Like, and, you know, it was kind of a poignant moment in our kind of life because all of a sudden, like, I, I suddenly realized that, you know, this passion that I had for my work and, you know, putting all this time into it, you know, suddenly she looked at it and it was like, oh, now I've got a mistress, right? I've got like a, uh, you know, something else better to do, um, you know, that was not hanging out and doing those types of things. And so for me, it became kind of like a, you know, an important little like crossroads. And I didn't realize it at the time, so I won't, I won't say that I noticed it at that time, but, you know, I look back and this was kind of like one of those, those things where, where things kind of, uh, kind of changed in front of me. So the next slide is about merging interests, adapt or die. And so basically what started to happen was is my wife had more free time than I did and I wasn't willing to make the free time. She started to kind of like slowly, you know, affect her will upon, you know, our mutual life. And so what that, you know, what happened was is, you know, she would schedule a vacation, for example. And, you know, there's never a perfect time to take a vacation. We always all get stressed out. We always, you know, we've got a deadline. There's something to work towards. I don't want to go. That was me, but like times 10, I was super anxious anytime we talked about like, oh, going out and living and doing fun things, you know, like who wouldn't want to go on a vacation? Like, I didn't want to go on a vacation. I was having more fun, you know, designing something, doing something. Um, it didn't sound fun to me. So for me, I had to kind of adapt or die. And that adaptation came when I suddenly picked up photography. And to me, that was suddenly like a thing where it's like, oh, here's something creative that I can do, but oh, wait, I can do it outside of work too. And I'm not good at it, so you know, kind of going back to the theme of earlier, earlier of not being a good designer and kind of wanting to crank real hard, like I kind of jumped on in. I was like, oh gosh, I really want to get really good at photography. Like this could be really good. So suddenly those vacations, like you know, something clicked, and I, you know, it probably wasn't early on. It probably took a while of you know, kind of beating and kicking at me, but I suddenly was like, oh, like getting away, going on vacations means I can bring my camera. Oh, it means I can be creative. Oh, it means like maybe I could use my photography in my work oh, wow, this might be kind of good. So it, it kind of took something like that, that adaptation, and finding something, you know, that I wanted to do and likening it, like finding a merging of, you know, my interests, like her interests of wanting to get up and go out and do things and go on vacations, go places, and me wanting to, you know, take pictures that, you know, I found a happy medium. And, but even then, it took me a while to actually have fun on vacations because I would still go on vacations, then I was all serious about, like, oh, what am I taking my pictures of? What's around? What's... You know, so it took a while, you know, and even till now to kind of truly be able to kind of sit and, and uh, you know, relax. And so, you know, just going to quickly go through a few pictures. I mean, these are just some of the things that, like, I can honestly say that if I wouldn't have picked up some of the, this thing and this attitude, you know, two things, like I said earlier, I'd probably be divorced. Two, I wouldn't have gone to some of these places, done some of these things, and taken some of these pictures. And this is just a small spattering of just kind of like things I've done, places I've been, you know, and I look back and I look at these with fondness and I go, gosh, like, what, what if I wouldn't have pulled myself out or be, been pulled out? Because I didn't pull myself out. You know, like, gosh, I wouldn't have been to these places. I wouldn't have done these things. I wouldn't have explored some things. You know, I wouldn't have these memories of, you know, I would just have memories of code and Photoshop and, you know, things like that, like, which is, you know, which isn't all that great maybe sometimes. So 
Um, you know, this is a quote that kind of came to my awareness, you know, recently with the passing of Maya Angelou, but, you know, making a living is not the same as making a life, and I think that's an important thing that I, I started to learn, you know, as a result of kind of these, like, you know, paradigm shifts within, within my life. Um, one thing that I want to say that was really important for me at this time was I thought I was doing a really good job. Um, we had had our first child, and I went into kind of provider mode. Like, I was like, oh, gosh, we have a child. Like, that's a lot of pressure. Like, I don't know how to be a dad, but I sure know how to work and, like, provide and make money. So I'm just going to, like, I'm going to start cranking. So that was kind of what I did. I became, like, the Uber provider, you know, and uh, I just started working really hard. Like, even, even harder, I felt, than, you know, that schedule that I, you know, posted. It was the same schedule, but I, I felt like I was putting more into it. There was anxiety that, like, I had to be better at what I did and, you know, do these, you know, be this, like, Superman. Um, the crazy thing was is it was kind of a vicious circle because the longer and harder I worked, the more money I made, the more kind of recognition I received, and at the same time, the more time I didn't have time for, you know, the, maybe what I would now say are the more important things. They are the more important things in my life. And, um, you know, I wasn't dedicating enough time to my wife. I wasn't dedicating enough time to my family. Like, I live like 15 minutes from my family, and I might see them like every three months. It's crazy, you know, I look back now and I go, that just wasn't the right, right way to be. So, um, you know, this was kind of like a, you know, big paradigm shift that I was starting to have, you know, but I was still obsessed with deadlines, projects, and we all get that way, but like I was, I was uber, uber, uber stressed about these things. Um, so, I, and I wanna say that, you know, to be a good husband, father, brother, son, like all these things, you know, you can't just be a provider, you have to kind of be physically there, like people value that stuff, they don't, uh, it, you know, I used to go, we would go up and visit my wife's family up in Fresno, California, and I would pull out the laptop the minute we got there, and I was like, you know, I look back, and it's like, well, why was I doing that? Like, they just were probably looking at me going, like, he doesn't like us. Like, what, 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 uh, what's going on with this guy? And it wasn't I didn't like him. I just, you know, I felt like I had, you know, other things. You know, I was in that provider mode. I was like, oh, I've got to, got to do all these things. So there are always consequences for not adapting fast enough. And I've kind of alluded a little bit to this, that, you know, there's bumps in the road. So, you know, for me, the, the adaptation didn't happen soon enough. You know, I talked to you, you know, about, oh, take it now, taking photography, doing that stuff. You know, I, I wasn't still having all that much fun. And like I said, I was whipping out the, the laptop or doing things when I was supposed to be present. So, um, you know, there were a couple of things that happened in that phase of my life. So, and these are like game changers, things that almost ended my, my, uh, my marriage and almost ended my career that I was putting so much time into. So my wife, over time, had kind of always approached me and been like, hey, you know, I, I think I, we, we want to move back to, I want to move back to Fresno where my parents are. They're both retired. They could help with the kids. We, we've talked about having a second child. They could really help. That could be a good deal. And I was always like, ah, oh, whatever. You, know, you, you get so in your head like, oh, I'm the, I'm the breadwinner. I'm the, I'm the, you know, the person who's providing financially. I've got this great career. Check me out. You know, who's... Everyone knows who I am, like I'm doing really good work, like it won't ever happen. Well, for me it happened and uh, you know, I basically got an ultimatum, you know, it was like, hey, we're, we're moving or we're kind of like, you know, done. So, you know, I had to move, you know, so basically what happened in this time is, you know, I had some of the most stressful things that you can have happen. So, you know, we sold our house, we're, we're, we lived in Orange County at the time, uh, we sold our house. Uh, we moved up to Fresno, California, which I don't know if anyone of you know where that is. It's in Central California. There's like no tech, no no anything. There's no like I couldn't, you know. Basically, if I moved there, I would have to have been, you know, a freelancer solely, and I, my fear was like doing like the Fresno Bagel Company website or something like that, you know. Um, I gave up coaching. I had to give up coaching after 16 years. Uh, the dynamics of my job changed, so thankfully, the company that I worked for, to advance, they were very accommodating and said, like, hey, we'll, we'll allow you to work remote. Um, and we had child number two. So a bunch of things happened all at once that just kind of completely, like, you know, were crazy, um, crazy in my life. And, uh, you know, we got there because I was putting way too much time into, you know, uh, my other love and my other passion, my work, you know, and not putting in a, investing enough time into, you know, some of the other things. So... You know, once again, I say all this stuff to kind of, you know, make you guys aware that, like, hey, these things happen and, you know, there are consequences to work too much. And a little bit later, I'll, I'll talk about, you know, some of the things to help avoid some of these things because, you know, I'm definitely not talking about not working and not doing things. But, um, you know, so sometimes you have to start over. So the, the moving represented that kind of, like, for me, like, starting over. Like, I had to relearn how to do things. Like, I had to relearn how to communicate because I was remote, you know, now. So, you know, not doing instant messenger and I am you know, talking to people on the phone, 
Um, you know, I had to learn how to work um, as a singular unit rather than kind of like in a big team and different things like that. There was a lot of adaptation, but you know, after the first year, I realized like, hey, there's really nothing I can do about the situation. So I need to kind of embrace it. So I embraced it. I embraced everything that it represented. I embraced, you know, kind of like out of sight, out of mind. You know, getting my work done uh, and meeting deadlines, but without people necessarily seeing how long or how hard I was working. Uh, you know, in the same kind of vigor that I went through and was like cranking through work and, you know, putting in, you know, 12 to 16 to 18 hours, you know, towards projects, I went the other way because I wanted to prove to my wife that, like, hey, I'm a, you know, I'm a good, I'm a good, uh, good person. I, our mutual, you know, is, is uh, important. Um, so, you know, I, I went the other way, you know, so I, I found ways to work smarter, faster, uh, so that I didn't have to, um, you know, be investing all of that time, but still not look like I wasn't like, you know, you know, no fall off in work, like not looking like I was phone, phoning it in or something like that. So then enter the, the, the third stage, you know, which is basically chaos. And I talked to you before, that's like kids. Um, the biggest thing I, I want to say to people who haven't reached this stage yet is just know that, you know, chaos is kind of an extreme word and I don't really mean chaos, but there's a lot of things going on. So as you guys are kind of cranking through your careers right now and you're thinking about like where you want to be in five years, 10 years, I want to be a creative director. I want to be, you know, all of those other things. I want to make millions. I want to do whatever. Like, just know that if you end up having kids and families, like, this kind of stage is coming. And while no one is ever prepared for it, like, no one ever knows how to, you know, to deal with that stuff, just know it's coming. And if you can kind of free up your plate a little bit for some of these things, like, I think it's, it's something that will hopefully benefit you guys that, because uh, I, didn't, I didn't do it until too late. So it was, it was definitely... You know, for me it was chaos, and hopefully for you guys it, it doesn't necessarily have to, have to be chaos. So, and then now I said, like I said before, I'm, I'm now in my 40s. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a completely different stage. I'm trying to find ways to mellow things out, but still keep that, you know, that high work capacity output for me going. So now I'm going to kind of go over and switch gears and, you know, start, stop talking a little bit about how I got to, you know, being punched in the face and, and realizing that, I, you know, throwing more hours into a day isn't the right thing, kind of get into a little bit about... For me, just like strategies for balancing out your life and, you know, once again, I, I don't want to misconstrue anything that I say here as like, you know, putting in not as much time or doing subpar quality work or quantity over quality, none of those things. These are all for me just like things and mentalities that I kind of go through on a day-to-day -day basis fighting for my time so that I'm, I'm working towards my goals, which are, you know, as you guys know, are, my goals are different than your goals, your goals are different than your boss's goals, you know, your, your goals are different than, you know, the people next to you. So the, the quick thing, um, this title might not make sense at first, but basically like if your life is in chaos and you've got like crazy things going on outside of your life, your work is gonna suffer. You're, you're without a doubt not gonna be able to focus as much. You're not gonna be able to you know, be as good as you can be. So if your guys' goal that you know, leaving here was to be inspired, you know, learn new tips and techniques so you can be better at work, like one thing that I would say is like don't ever get out of whack with your personal life because that's something that'll, it'll, you know, I remember when the, when the things were really chaotic, like I didn't even want to work. I was, I, I think I even at one point phoned my boss and was like, I quit. I just want to like have a month off. Like I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have any obligations. So, you know, so the analogy I'm using to put the oxygen mask is, you know, we've all been on an airplane. Some of you guys flew here. You know, what do they say? They say, you know, okay, in case of an emergency landing or, you know, we're going to land in the water, you know, a mask will drop down from your, you know, in front of you, grab it, put it on yourself first, and then put the mask on the person next to you. So for me, that's always been a good analogy that, you know, to, to fix yourself and your, you know, kind of your life life. Uh, it starts with you. You know, you have to make that a priority for you. Your boss isn't going to wait for the perfect moment to be like, hey, Shane, like, stop working. Like, you're, you're putting in 18 hours a day. They're like going like, hey, yeah, you're putting in 18 hours a day, and he's cranking along and meeting goals, and, you know, this work is great, and I'm not going to mess up a thing. You know, no one else is going to you know, other than maybe if you have a wife that cares or, you know, someone who cares, like, no one's going to stop and be like, hey, you know, you're, you're going a little crazy. So, you know, put that oxygen mask on yourself and, um, you know, you kind of have to, like I said, be a little selfish and, and do that for yourself. So the next thing is, is there's, there's a huge difference between working effectively and working efficiently. So I realized that, you know, early in my career I was really effective, but my effectiveness was because I was putting tons of hours into something. So effectiveness is kind of measured by like, okay, you set a goal, you achieve a goal. Person's effective. You know, you launch an app and you want to, you know, have it downloaded a million times, you reach that. Okay, that's great. You know, you're effective at what you're doing. Efficiency is doing, doing that, I don't want to say in a minimalistic state, but, you know, doing it 
and define kind of time, you know, so it's, it's like, you know, we've all been on projects that, you know, have been six month projects and they've launched and they've launched successfully, but, you know, could it have been done in like two or three with like half the, you know, half the headache? So that, that's efficiency. So it's, you know, it's about doing both, you know, and you should want to try and, uh, you know, strive for that. Um, the next thing is, is no Twinkies or junk food. And, you know, that's kind of for me like an analogy. Um, oh, it is an analogy. Um, something that, you know, using, don't, don't have useless activities in your day that, uh, you know, they're like eating junk food. They're just like empty calories. We all know that, hey, if you eat five Twinkies, you know, uh, a day, or not a day, like in a week, you know, you're eventually going to gain some weight. So, you know, one Twinkie, not a big deal. Five Twinkies, it's going to start, you know, you're going to start gaining some weight. So, you know, are all those Twinkies, you know, worth it? So, you know, the typical things like, you know, if you're, if you're working on a deadline, you have to unplug. You have to, you know, turn off all those little silly distractions, you know, the Facebook, the Twitter, do all those types of things. Uh, you know, when I get, need to get something done, I mean, I'll even turn off e all email. Like, I will not answer emails until, like, middle of the day, maybe end of the day. You know, that's if you have, like, a goal that you're set for. You have a, you have a project that you're, you're working towards because, you know, remember when emails come in, like, those are emails that are coming in on someone else's time when they want something, not necessarily what works best for you and, and uh, you know, whatever your schedule, whatever deadlines you set at the beginning of the day. Um, you know, one that was really hard for me is I was always one of those people who, if you looked online, and it's Messenger, I was always online 24-7, and I still accidentally leave stuff on, um, like Skype I leave on. I don't even use Skype, but, you know, I realized real quick that, okay, it's a lot easier to just kind of, like, unplug that stuff, you know, and only have it on on the times where I'm willing to be kind of distracted or willing to be, you know, have conversations and, and um, do some of those things. Uh, foosball is the enemy, and I, I jokingly say this, foosball doesn't really mean foosball to me, but, you know, an example that, uh, you know, has always resonated with me is that uh, way back in the days when I wasn't very good, uh, I was at one of those dot-bomb companies, I mean, in the early 2000s when, you know, we're talking about a company that had like 5,000 employees doing websites, and things started to get slow, and um, big thing that everyone did was like, oh, we don't have anything to do, let's go play foosball. For whatever reason, you know, Thanks to God that I, at that time, like I just kind of, maybe it was being antisocial that day, but I was like, ah, I don't really want to do play foosball. And basically what I started doing is, you know, like I said, my inspirations were, you know, at the time there's all these flash things going on and every, you know, I wanted to be like that. I started picking up flash and I would just use it in my free time. So those two or three hours that, you know, maybe somebody didn't have any billable work to do and they were off playing foosball, I was off doing, learning flash. And, you know, it basically, you know, the things that I did after that led to, you know, everything that I ever dreamed about, everything, you know, awards, recognition, better projects, um, all of that stuff. This was, this was my first personal portfolio site launched like in 2002, 2003 that I, I became known for. I mean, this is now you know, 12 years old, but this came out of all the work that I was putting in during my work hours that weren't billable hours because there was nothing to do. You know, so I look back and you know, if, if you've got free time you know, during your, your work, like don't, don't fill them with the Twinkies. Like find something that you're passionate about and do, do something else that you know, is gonna help you. Because um, otherwise you're just, you know, you're giving up that time for free. So next thing is, and this is important, you mean, I mean I hear this a lot at, you know, everywhere, conferences, but like be unique. And what I mean by that is, is um, you know, so the example of the foosball and learning flash, like because of where I was at and learning the new things, you know, this is now different technologies, we're talking about CSS3 and animation and, you know, WebGL or different things like that, like be unique, be the person who learns some of these things that everyone else doesn't know. And the, the power of that is, is that basically when you're sitting there and you, you might be a junior designer, you might be the low guy on the totem pole, but if you have something unique about you, a unique skill that no one else in the room has, then suddenly you have a little bit of power because people are gonna come to you asking for like, oh, what should we do here? Oh, how long is this gonna take? Uh, how long would this take you? And you can start to kind of like, you know, make those you know, kind of like decisions for people as to what you're, what you're willing to be committed to, how long you're willing to be committed to them, and uh, control your, your destiny a little bit. Next thing is, is establish a style. I think, you know, a lot of times, and this goes two ways. A lot of times these days I think you hear people, you know, and I fall on this too, like I don't want to be linked to one style. I want to be able to do all styles, all things. But styles are actually really important because styles can help you kind of like streamline yourself a little bit. You know, styles, don't just mean like a design style in Photoshop. It means a coding style. It means like a, you know, how, you, how you start off a project, how you package up your assets so that you can, you can start and hit the ground running. It's you know, have a, a set of problem solving solutions for uh, different problems that you have all the time. It's a set of actions. It's, a, you know, it's, it's anything. The style you know, is whatever your way of handling a solution is. And the more you have a personal style, 
the more that, man, you, like I said, you can hit the ground running on a project. You, you don't waste time like sitting there and staring at a canvas and oh, what should I do? Oh, I don't know, like, oh, this is kind of hot now, this isn't. Like start somewhere that you, start somewhere you feel comfortable and if it you know, still goes down that path, great. And if it deviates, that's, that's great too. But, um, so the next one is Superman never gets a day off. And that, that's a pretty, this is an important one because for me at different points in my career, like I became the, the person who would like, you know, who, who, who wants to work over the weekend to work on this? I'd be the first person, you know, raise my hand. And you kind of become known for different things, you know, depending upon where you work. So don't be always the person who sets the precedence of like taking on the crappy projects to save the day. Or, you know, try not to always be the person who, you know, oh, only, you know, only Shane can fix this or something like that. You know, because basically when you become that person, then, you know, all the weight kind of rides on your shoulders a little bit. Um, it's a hard position to be in because you can't ever really say no. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, an opposite into the be unique thing because there's, there's a double-edged sword. Like being unique and being the person, go-to person is great, but on the other hand, being the go-to person for the fix-it guy, like that's, that's uh, you know, not an easy thing to do. Uh, another thing that kind of falls into this is like don't answer emails late at night. Like if people start to email you and you're answering and responding at 10, 11, 12 at night, like, they're gonna get used to that, and they're gonna get used to the fact that, oh, the Shane's up, he'll, he'll do this fix by tomorrow morning, and everything will be done and peachy and well with the world. Um, and, and that's a tough position to be in. It's good to be in and out of that, but try, try not to, to be that person all the time. Uh, this one's kind of maybe an easy one to, to imagine, but you know, plan vacations first. So with my wife, like I said, she, she loves doing vacations. She loves to go and do things like, you know, she'll always come and be like, hey, what are we doing on this date? I, I can't tell you what I'm doing five days from now. Like, it's just so many things change. So I've just gotten in the habit of having her just say like, okay, just go and book whatever it is. We'll work our way around it. Because there, there's no perfect time ever for vacations. But I used to get such anxiety that was like, oh, something's due. Like, got, got, I can't have to be completely free until after this. Well, there's always a deadline. There's always something coming up. And there's always something that's going to stress us out. So you know, trying not to be in those, you know, in that mode of, you know, oh, wait for the perfect time. There's never a perfect time to go out and live your life and do different things. Uh, this goes back to a little bit of, you know, what I said about being unique, but, you know, be the best, best at what you do. Um, you know, you'll always be able to, you know, make those this decisions on when things are due, uh, how they should be done. You know, if you're, a, if you're the low designer on the totem pole, like, you should be expect to be told like, hey, I want it done this way. This is how you do it. You know, whatever. You know, so as you, you know, hopefully the the idea is, is that you rise up in your career. You become the best in wherever you work, um, and you can start to you know control those situations so that you're not always at the at the beck and call of everyone else. Uh, learn these two words, no and help. No was an impossible word for me to learn. I didn't learn it until my late 30s. To be honest, I was always just that. You know, I always cared about what people thought in that Superman mentality of like, oh, I'll, I'll take care of it for you. I mean, this goes all the way to the people that we all get in our lives where it's like, you know, the relative, can you do a website for me? And you're like, yeah, I know. I mean, you need to learn how to, how to say no. And I can guarantee you that your, your life will exponentially get better when you kind of have said that once or twice, you know, start small. But, you know, it even goes all the way up to, you know, clients and bosses. I mean, don't be afraid to say no. And this is, this is not doable within this time or, you know, no, I'm not doing this, but let's, or a couple of us do this, you know, different things like that. And the second one, help is important. To me, there's always more time on projects. And uh, I've said this for a long time. You know, we all have deadlines, we have these crazy, you know, things that, you know, where people are like, this is the drop dead deadline. Well, how many times have we ever had like a, a deadline and then like the client didn't get the copy on time? You know what I mean? It's like, you know, there's always, you know, something. So, you know, the moral of the help thing is, is, um, you know, if you get into a spot where you honestly don't feel like you want to or you can't, you know, do that push for crazy hours, doing whatever, like, raise your hand and ask for help because you never know. There might be something where, you know, another project can have someone pulled from it. You know, another project deadline that you might be on might be able to be changed to open up some more time. There's always kind of some options and there's always, you know, always something to, um, to possibly help you out. So next one is fear is a great motivator. And I say this uh, jokingly, but it goes into... Um, things that I've said already, like I'm more afraid of like pissing off my wife or making my kids sad than I am about having my boss pissed off at me or um, you know a client or something like that. Uh, obviously, we don't want to piss off the, our bosses. We don't want to piss off our clients. But like I'm more afraid of my wife, so I I, would, I will do anything possible to try and finish that project so that I don't have to you know do something on a vacation. I don't have to do something in my free time, which would you know make me um, have to do that. 
So group similar tasks together. Um, so an example of this came up with me the other day. I was in like a QA phase of a project where I'm getting like all these emails, you know, about like bugs and you know this needs to be handled in this browser or whatever. And my first inclination is always like, oh shoot, I got to hop on this. Well, I was already in another, you know, another project and doing something that if I would have stopped and done that, I would have completely derailed, you know, the, the kind of the creativity that I had going on at one. And the deadline wasn't, you know, anything where I had to have it done within like two hours or anything like that. So, but it, you know, I had to stop and take a breath and be like, okay, once again, turn off the email. Don't do these things because you never know. And in the case of, you know, the example I gave, it ended up that a bunch of the things that came in over the course of like three hours ended up being all circled around one or two things. So if I would have hopped on the first thing, the first minute that it came in, like I would have done some time but then stopped and later done something that, you know, fixed another problem or added something to it or was around it. So, you know, sometimes wait for all the information to kind of come all in before you start making decision, um, decisions on how to, how to tackle things. More time does not equal better work. How many of us have ever been on like a six month project or even three months or whatever and the project has turned out like complete crap? I, I, happens all the freaking time. I mean, there's, you know, and, it's, and sometimes it's like the little tweak that just bugs you and sometimes it's like, no, this thing is just a, a piece of you know what, you know, and it's, so sometimes more time isn't, you know, better work. And, uh, you know, for me, a, kind of like a more smaller example of this is, you know, so I, I used to work with the person who, you know, let's say we had a week to do like a pitch comp for something like that, you know, so I would try and get my, because I, I was trying to fit all my things into to the day, like I would work incrementally in my stuff. I would work, work a day, I would, I would figure out like an idea of what I wanted to do, I would execute it, uh, close it down for the day, wake up the next day and see if like it, uh, you know, if it's still applied the next day. And if I hit a good spot, you know, a day or two or three before everything was due, I would, I would just stop. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily try and tweak to make a button more shiny or glossy or whatever it was that I knew wasn't really going to change the way the client looked at the comp. Well, I had a coworker who, you know, he's the type of person who would be like, oh, I, I need to surf for inspiration. I'm going to, you know, look and, you know, what style am I going to do? What, you know, all this stuff. And so he didn't take all day long and be surfing, you know, YouTube and inspiration and doing all these things. And, you know, then all of a sudden be the night before the things do and like cranking along and like, oh, I pulled an all-nighter to get this thing done and everyone's patting them on the back and, you know, oh, I did this, whatever. And then, you know, all for what, you know, and then the, the, the comp doesn't get picked, you know, it was like, oh, you, you, you put your, all your eggs into, you know, spreading this thing out over time, you know, and you ended up, you know, and then being behind on other projects because, you know, he was using that time to kind of like, you know, bleed and, and surf, you know, for inspiration. So for me, that's a, you know, a real world example. Uh, treat everyone like they're first. So the problem with having extracurricular activities and other things is you can't make the, the people that you're with at the time feel like that other thing is actually there. It's probably best you don't even tell anybody about it, you know, unless it's, you know, like, you know, I, I, in the past I've used like, oh, my wife needs me to do this. But, you know, so in the example of football, like, you know, you don't tell your work that you have this other better thing to do. Just be really productive, uh, achieve your deadlines, meet your goals, you know, do all those things. Like, you don't need to let anybody know that you might have something better to do that is motivating you to be, you know, to, to be more efficient and, uh, you know, get your, get your stuff done. Uh, because chances are if you tell them that, you know, they're going to start all of a sudden feeling like, you know, like, you know, they are the second. So, and that's not good. So, something I've changed over the years as I've gotten older is start off the day right, play first. So, for me, like, uh, I, I would always, uh, if a deadline suddenly, like, pushed something, like, I, I used to work out after 5 o'clock. Uh, if something happened, like a bug, something came in and I after, had to work till like 5.30, like, I would find myself derailed. Like, I didn't even want to go and didn't want to go work out, I wouldn't do whatever, I would just go kind of home and, and uh, hang out and I would completely miss on something that I needed. So for me, like working out is a cathartic thing, like it helps me kind of get, um, break through the monotony of everything. So, you know, play first. So I, I've moved everything so it's like get the things out of the way that you want to do in the beginning of the day. Could be surfing, could be working out, could be, you know, going and seeing your family, it could be whatever, coming to work a little bit late. A lot of people come to work late, but use that as kind of like get it, get it done first so that you already kind of go through the day and you feel like, hey, okay, I at least got, you know, my stuff done. Especially on a day where you know it's going to be kind of like a crazy one. Like, like get something for yourself in at the beginning of the day. Uh, play a lot of mental Tetris. And this one's kind of a big one for me. So one thing that I realized is that, you know, as I was, you know, and this was kind of in the middle years when I was being pulled away. And I didn't really want to be away from the computer. Like, I had to figure out how to do my problem solving without physically being there at the computer. So, you know, there's a lot of times where I'll just be sitting there and my wife will look at me and be like, what's wrong? Are you mad? Are you whatever? And I'm just kind of like sitting there like thinking, I know I'm, I'm playing mental Tetris. I'm moving the, moving the pieces around. 
So whether you're coding, whether you're designing, like, you know, it, it's no different than sketching. You know, try to, try to get yourself spatially to that spot where you can kind of actively problem solve because what I've, what I've found is in the past, what I would do is, you know, I would throw time at a problem over the weekend. So it's like, oh, I just want to get two hours to like sit down and, and whatever. And so that turns into four hours, six hours or something and then, you know, come and then I still have to do more stuff Monday. Well, what I'll do now is I'll play the mental Tetris all weekend long and then Monday when I come in, like I hit the ground running and I already have my plan of attack. I already know how I'm going to, how I'm going to do everything. So this is a big one, run yourself like a business. And the way I'm going to describe this is, you know, I mean, it kind of is what it says, you know, run yourself like a business. So if you're a business and, and for pretend you're an individual and you bid on a project, you know, and you say, oh, okay, so this project that I'm going to, you know, is going to cost $20,000 and it's going to take me two months to do. Well, if it takes you four months, you just lost money, right? So in the same economy of, you know, just being a designer in an agency, being a designer anywhere, like if you, you know, say like, hey, this is going to take me such and such amount of you know, hours to do, and it takes double, like you're, you're losing the economy of time. You're, you're losing that money, you're losing that, that those life experiences outside of, of work because you have to make up for you know, not planning right or something like that. So you, you really have to, you know, when I talk about not working as much or being super efficient, like there's a reason for it, and there's multiple reasons. One is you know, you're always gonna meet your deadlines, hopefully. Uh, the second is, is you know, the more projects that you get done, and once again, I don't mean quickly, I'm not talking about doing bad work, more projects that you get done, if you're at a high level and you're doing really good work, like that's more opportunities for cooler projects. If you're only able to do three projects a year and they all end up being really crappy projects, well, you don't have any really good work to show for the year. So, you know, the more that you can kind of like get out of crappy projects and into cool projects, or the more pro projects you're exposed to, the more chances you're going to do good work. Um, and then the final thing is, is just, you know, constantly, I'm going to kind of read from this because it was something that I read at the time that to me fits, says constantly dream and think about who you want to be and the things you want to accomplish. Set, set short-term goals, but also set big picture long-term goals. Be relentless in fighting to achieve them amongst all of the noise in your life. There's always something, someone out there trying to distract you from your goals. You are the only person who has your best interests in mind. Run yourself like a Bur the Burger King slogan. <laughs> Have it your way. It's your life. To it's your life to live. And then the final slide is uh, by Bruce Lee. If you love life, don't waste time. For time is what life is made up, made up of. So there you go.